Hello, this is Dwight Kelly, one of the researchers and students of history that has helped put together the website that recognizes and memorializes the African-American high schools in Louisiana before 1970 on our website. Today, Dr. Russell Hill, one of my colleagues, and spends time talking with legendary Southern University baseball coach Roger Cater. Sit back and listen to an outstanding educational history lesson and a success story from a New Roads area native son. You are in for a treat. Good morning, Coach Cato. How are you today? Good morning, Russell Hill. I want to say Dr. Hill, but you won't let me. Okay. Well, um, uh, Coach Cato, I understand that you attended Rosenwald High School. I certainly okay. did. Graduated in the uh, spring of 1969. Spring 1969. Uh, roughly, your your time at Rosenwald parallels my time at Thomas A. Levy. I graduated in spring 1968. Oh, my. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was one of our big rivalries, T.A. Levy. Yes. Uh, well, Coach Kadar, uh, I'm interested in... Base, I'm not basic, I'm interested in Southern University, but the purpose of this interview is to establish your formative years at uh, Rosenwald High School and prior to then. So I'm interested in talking about largely your high school, in, uh, your high school uh, experience. Okay. Now, Rosenwald High School, where is Rosenwald High School located? Well, it's in New Roads, Louisiana. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it was one of the, it was the only uh, black school in, 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 the, in New Roads at that time. Well, it still is. Well, there's only one black school there now, if it is. But um, we mainly, it encompassed uh, the areas right outside of New Road that the kids had to go to school there. Like I was from Ventress, so we had to go to school there once we passed a certain grade. Once we got out of the sixth, seventh grade, we had to end up going to New Road to continue our education, or you end up in the cotton field. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, what was your what was your school name in Ventress, Louisiana? Well, I started at a little school in the primary grade called DuPont. Uh, at that time, the name of the area was called DuPont, Louisiana. Uh, I think what happened back in the days, the big slave owners and plantation owners had cities named after themselves. You got me? Yes. Because now DuPont, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to find it on the National Register nowhere. But it was sit on the bank of the uh, Falls River, and then I went. After that, we went to a, a, a school, and I, I I'm thinking this was called Rosenwald also. But listen to this: it was a one room building where everybody was in the same room. The teacher taught everybody. So I'm in there, youngster, with grown men, lady, you know, and literally, and. I don't know how we made it, but we got out of it. You know, the lady, Miss Abair, was the teacher, and she got us out. She was able to keep the the room disciplined and did the best she could with what she had to work with. Oh, okay. Now, uh, will you tell me uh, what were some of the other communities uh, that contributed to the Rosenwald High School student body? Well, Point Capi, which is a, uh, even though we have Point Capi Parish, there was a place outside of New Road they called Point Capi. And we had Lottie and Fodosh, uh, Falls River, Ventress, Lakeland, uh, Irvingville. All of those places have contributed to uh, probably, I don't know if we went into Morgasm, 
we probably went to the skirt of Morganza and came back, but it was far reaching because it was the only school that we, in that area, and there was another mm -hmm. high school bachelor in the northern part of mm -hmm. the of the uh, parish, uh, beyond Morgan, beyond Morganza, that took in the rest of the kids. So that's how the thing worked, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we we did it. I mean, you know, found buses, mm -hmm. got us up. We had to get up early, get on the bus, and we mm -hmm. made it to school on time. Okay. Now was. Valverda and Ennis also a part of that commun those communities that contributed to it? Yeah, but they were uh, small. They were obviously elementary. They were not high schools. Right, as far as contributing to the student body of uh, yeah, Rosemont. Yeah, they did. Yes, sir. You're yes. correct. They did contribute to them. Valverda and those schools uh, contributed to the enrollment at Rosemont. Okay, and Livonia as well. That was, uh, Hello, Papa, you as well. You're correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, uh, since you were coach at coach at Southern University, uh, what was the time period that you were uh, you were coaching at Southern University? From uh, the summer of 1980 to the spring of 2017. To 2017, and that was you were the head coach for baseball. Well, I started for from 1980 to 1984 as an assistant basketball coach, okay. and then from August of '84 to 2017, the head baseball coach. So it was a period of uh, many years uh, at that university. Okay, now. I would like for you to tell me uh, how were you introduced to baseball from the very beginning? How did you get introduced to baseball? You know, I, I get asked that question a lot, and as far as I could go back, first we started. We were playing in the neighborhood baseball. You got me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, I ended up growing a little, a little bit. I ended up growing. I was a I wasn't six five then. I was probably six one, six two, skinny, gangling kid. And uh, at fifteen years old, I got to be decent, I guess. And uh, and I got a one day as a man from the New Road area came to visit my mother. Uh, his name was Low Fans. I don't Low Fans told my mother he would take care of me. He wanted me to play. My mother did not want me to play sports. She said, no, I'm not letting my baby go. And back then, rather than ask the daddy, they would ask the mother because it goes to show you. Even back then, how much say-so the mothers, the women in the black community, had say-so over family members, the kids, you got me? Mm -hmm. So she was the one approaching she didn't give in, and I never even, I didn't question her about it. I went to school, and they saw me play. You know, we were playing in practice, just got kids getting together playing, and Mr. Lovance came back, and he convinced my mother, your son is a good player, let us have him. Because she was concerned I would be playing with much older men, and she didn't want her son in the company of men that she didn't know and some of the things they may do and say because she didn't want me to hear it. But she she gave in and let me go. And that's how I started playing with older men, 30-some years old. Yeah. And I'm a 15-year-old kid. Okay. Now, what position did you play that uh, in that? First base. Right. And what was the, uh, what was the team, what was the name of the team? Well, I can't remember the name of the team. Uh -huh. All I know, there probably was New Road Giants or, you know, something. I, I really can't remember, uh -huh. you know. Okay. Uh, and this was before you played organized ball in high school, am I correct? That's right, because I, I was 16 before I went for, out for the uh, baseball team 
at Rosenwald. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, so mm -hmm. I'll just say that and let you continue to ask the question because it'll lead off into into that, okay? Now, yes. Now, what communities did you that you play against in the community baseball? Well, we played against uh, uh, that bird, wherever bird lounge is. We played against Irvinville. We played against uh, 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 people in uh, Malguin. We played against people in Bachelor. Uh, you know, and uh, we played in, in the Bad Ridge area. So we played all around. People in St. Francisville, we played against them. So we played against a multitude of everybody. Every community had a team back then. And on Sunday, every community played baseball on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of of what happened back in the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the farthest you had to travel to play community baseball? Baton Rouge. <laughs> Baton Rouge was the furthest. Okay. Keep in mind, that's the furthest I ever been since before I went to Southern. <laughs> okay. Now, um, what? Uh, did you play org a community baseball first, or did you play organized baseball? Uh, did you play school community baseball? Community. Okay. When did you start at Rosenwald High School? Well, you know, I was playing basketball, and after my second year JV ball, a couple of my teammates were going out for baseball. And this was my sophomore, junior year. And they said, come on, man, come on out for the team. We could make the team better. And I said, really? And I went out. You know, the big pro problem I didn't want to go out for the team is that I lived in Ventress. And once that bus leaves, I, you know, it wasn't like in basketball. My coach, Roosevelt Collins, lived in Ventress, so I had a ride home. But in baseball, I had no ride. So that was my big issue. And uh, and I got to be decent enough where the coach did take me, Solomon Jackson, he did bring me home because he felt that I had some possibility. And so he took that, he said, I'll take you home. See, that's the kind of things back then that coaches did, you know. And we're talking about, it may not be a big issue today, but you know, it was a 20 minutes each way ride. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm Which back then was a long way. <laughs> yes. At least it seemed that way. <laughs> yes. Now, you mentioned that you played junior varsity basketball. That's how I first started. Okay. Now, tell me, how did you get into basketball, your earliest introduction to basketball? We finally got an old black and white TV, probably 10, 12 inches. And I used to watch the Boston Celtics. And I loved the teamwork, the pick and roll, give and go, the great teamwork that they had. And I wanted to play. And I was growing up. I began to shoot up, and I said, I'm going to play basketball. I went and picked pecan, bought me a basketball, and put a goal up, built a backboard for the going on it, stick it in the ground in my sister backyard mm -hmm. under and, a tree. And you were about how old? <laughs> when, how I was 12, 13 maybe mm -hmm. at best. And I practiced because I had never played any sports. And I was very, uh, very awkward, you know. If I was walking, I could trip and fall. That's how clumsy I was. And uh, so I practiced alone all them days in the summer, all by myself. And then that's when I went out for the for JV team and got cut by Roosevelt Collins. And rather than accept him cutting me, I came back the next day, and the next day, and the following day, and the following. And that's how... You know, I often, when I talk with Mr. Collins, he's the only of all the coaches who coached me in high school and college, and probably in the professional.
professional rank. He's the only coach that's still alive. And he and I, we laugh all the time because I, t- I tell him, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you for not standing your ground. You know, to stay in your ground, Lord, now you can literally shoot someone. You got me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. But he didn't stay in his ground. He allowed me to come back. He looked at me, and he allowed me to st- come back, and he continued to drop me off at my house. So you got to give the man some credit that, you know, he cut me, but he allowed me to come back. And, and by the time the season began, I showed tremendous improvement. And the rest is history. Okay. Now, when did you, how were you when you started junior varsity basketball at Rosenwald High School? Rosenwald. 13, 14 years old. 13, 14. So you were in the eighth grade or ninth grade? Ninth grade. Ninth grade. Hmm. Okay. Do you recall any of the members of your junior, of the Rosenwald junior varsity basketball team? One guy I remember, and I'll never forget him, named Lloyd Jones. Lloyd Jones was the point guard, but he was a diminutive guy, a little short, small, short guy. Mm-hmm. And he took a liking to me. Every morning when we got to school, before classes started, we get early, we went to the gym. And he, we worked with me on layups. And he used to fuss, but was loving, and tell me I could do it. Work on this, look at this. And that's what I did every morning. And uh, finally, I was able to dunk a ball by him showing me how to get my, my my timing together because it was timing to jump. You know, keep in mind, never had no kind of formal training. So that's the one guy I do remember. Uh, Anthony Ward. Ward was another guy. I don't remember many people as the years goes along. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alfred Thomas, so it wasn't many people I remember. Oh, okay. Um, and when did you uh, begin playing varsity basketball at Roswell High School? Well, two years later. Okay. So and that's probably when I became 16. Uh, going into my junior year, I was good enough then to make the team. And... Uh, and uh, Solomon Jackson was my coach in basketball, uh, varsity, who was my baseball coach. So, you know, again, he, he told me if I work hard, something good could happen to me. You know, and I, keep, I kept working, kept working, and I got to be pretty doing good. In the, at that time, for Rosenwald, mm-hmm. you know. Right. And you played center? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you recall any members of your high school basketball team? Well, remember, Lord Jones was still there, Anthony Ward, Anthony Daisy, Alfred Thomas, uh, and I can't remember. I can't remember anyone else. Oh, okay. Good. We didn't have, we probably had 10 kids playing. We didn't have a lot of players. Oh, okay. So. Oh, okay. Who did you play? Uh, what teams did you play? Well, the teams in our district were Capita, Scotlandville, and McKinley. So we were okay. comprised of a 14 district. The three bad nurse, bigger school, well, they were the only black schools with, uh, or, you know, mm-hmm. high school, and we played against them. Okay. We should have probably been in the same league with T. E. Levy because we were similar, and we may have, may have had a few more students than T. E. Levy. But, you know, we did compete against them in Port Allen. Okay, you're saying Corn High, Corn high School. In Port Allen, uh-huh. yes. Yes. Did you, uh, did you play against uh, Iberville High School? I certainly did. Okay. They had one of the great players to ever come out of the state of Louisiana, Joe the Pro Simpson. Mm-hmm. What a pro. He was a pro in the eighth grade. They were calling him a pro in the eighth grade. That's how good he was. He was physically, physically such a specimen 
in the eighth grade. I mean, it was just amazing. Oh, okay. Uh, what were, I mean, did you all play uh, some of the other, what were some of the other schools you all played? Well, there was a place school we played bachelor. Uh, we went to Bucky and played a school, school in Bucky. But we didn't venture too far away. Those mm -hmm. were the schools. We didn't play any schools in New Orleans. We played St. Francisville. All of the schools within the 50 to 60 mile radius. Mm -hmm. That's who we played. We didn't go venture too far away from there. Okay. Um, and did by any chance you play East High in Clinton? No, we didn't go there. Cheneyville? We played Cheneyville. Okay, what about Northwestern in Zachary? Well, that's where it was, Northwestern. We played Northwestern and Cheneyville. Mm hmm. Okay, and that was John Dawson in St. Francisville, am I correct? Yeah, it was Dawson High, you're correct. Yeah. Okay, and it was George Washington Carver High School in a Bucky. Bucky, yes, sir. Yes, okay. Um, and yeah. it was Bachelor High School in Mar uh, Mar uh, in Bachelor. Correct. Now, I'd like to look at your competitors in basketball. You mentioned Joe the Pro. Do you recall any of the other athletes who you competed against in yeah. basketball? And, and the reason I mentioned Joe the Pro, he was a once in a lifetime player. And to this point, I hadn't seen anybody quite like him. Uh, played against Fred Hilton uh, from McKinley. Uh, Capita have, had a guy named Gerald Combs that was a pretty good player. Um, and Scott Laville had the Cannon Boys, uh, who ended up both of them played pro ball. Uh, and they were big time players. And they had a couple of other players at, at Capita. I can't, I mean, at Scott Laville, I can't recall that name, but the Cannon Boys were really dynamic players. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it was amazing how good they were. And they were big. They were tall. I mean, you know, 6'1". Yeah. The, the youngest one was 6'10". And I think Emmanuel was the, must have been 6'8", six, 6'9", six, the older one. So they were pretty tall. Oh, okay. Uh, can you recall some of the other players from, let's say, Northwestern or, or Dawson? No. Okay. Okay. And remember, see, you had to have been a premium for your name to endure 50 some years 60 years later you have to be you have to have done something you got me yes i understand and uh you know so the names i call are the names that you know gotta let you know that wasn't communities in that area that just was not that many great great players that can endure the test of time. Now, there were plenty of good players, but we're talking about the upper echelon of players, you got me? Uh-huh. Yeah, so that just didn't happen. Okay. But the one thing I remember, I can recall, my senior year, I had gotten to be pretty doing good, and, and there was a scout came to look at Joe Pro Simpson from Iberville, and the scout was from Louisiana Tech. And Joe the Pro told him, you need to go to Rosamoy and look at a guy named Roger Kadar. And I'll never forget because he's the only guy ever came to, to the school. He came uh, and being the white coach on top of that back in 69. And he went to the office, look at my grades, and that was the last time I saw him because I realized now my grades weren't going to be good enough to have to get in to Louisiana Tech. And it was a it was a blessing in disguise that I didn't go there because I wasn't prepared. Southern was better suited for someone like me. Uh, when did you start playing baseball in high school? In my 
my junior year. You started in your junior year. Right. Uh, what position did you play? First base. You were first baseman. Uh, did you ever pitch or change positions at any time? No. Okay. Okay. Do you recall uh, the teams who you played baseball against? What teams did you? Well, the you... same teams. Okay. You know, the teams in that area, T. and Levy had a team, Capital, McKinley, Scotlandville, uh, St. Francisville, Dawson. Uh, Northwestern, I you T. And Levy. Yeah, but those are the teams. We didn't play a bunch of teams. Mm -hmm. We might have played against Sunshine. Sunshine. I'm, I'm missing Sunshine. We played against them in basketball. Okay. The big Grace kid, they had a, a big old kid, Grace, in the seven or eight grade playing. Oh. Named Reginald. Reginald. He was the last of the Grace brothers. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Now, what did you think about the level of competition in baseball in high school? It was pretty good. And, uh, again, you did, again, they, it was it was like basketball. I don't know much about football because I didn't play. But when I look at who stood the test of time, where the great players came from, they came out of Scotlandville, where the better, you know, they, because they, a lot of them went to college. And uh, that tells something about the Scotlandville area. It was rich in basketball, football, track and field, baseball. And, uh, I mean, I can't... You know, I'm trying to think of some in a great name that stood the test of time. And I can't. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but McKinley. McKinley was, let me tell you why McKinley beat us. They had better coaches. They had a, a Mr. Spooner, and I don't know if that name rings a bell. Spooner was a coach. But Spooner was more than a coach. Mr. Spooner used to bring in the big league players, the Hank Island. Willie McCovey, Willie May, Bob Gibson. Uh, you know, he brought them here for the kids' clinic every year. Kurt Flood, Lou Brock, they all were here. And they came to do clinics for the Baton Rouge City, Baton Rouge City Kids, Baton Rouge Kids Clinic. Baton Rouge City Kids Clinic was the name of it. And for many years, Mr. Spooner exposed those kids in the Baton Rouge area to these kind of players, you got me? Yes. Where 30 some miles away and never knew nothing about it. You see, that I would have loved to have gone to listen to those guys talk baseball, you got me? Yes. But no, no one ever mentioned that to me. I had to find out when I went to college that that was taking place 30 miles from me and they knew nothing about it. And that's part of what happened back in those days because we didn't have the, the news outlet. They didn't put something on the radio or the newspaper. Hey, this is coming to town. It's free. Bring all the kids. See, that's the kind of thing that was lacking back then. Mm -hmm. yes. But that's but the people did a, a, as good a job as they could with what they had to work with, you got me? Yes. It's not a fault. I'm not faulting them. I'm just highlighting that the obstacles that they had to deal with. It was an obstacle. Mm -hmm. Not being able to get information, you got me? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so, Coach Kadar, uh, during your high school years, uh, since I know since you went to the next level, uh, what type of recognition awards did you get in baseball? None. Okay. But nobody ever got it that I know of. Okay. I don't know if that was ever an all district team or anything. Okay. I never got anything. Okay. What about in basketball? None that I know of. Yeah. Did your school recognize you? The school might have given me a plaque my senior year. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> mean. Okay. I think the senior year, they might have given me a blank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that was...
was this? That wasn't something you were going to get. Isn't that amazing, though, huh? Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Because I asked Mr. Collins, I said, Mr. Collins, have you ever done an interview before? He said, no, he never did an interview. He's the guy who talked for 20 years, never did an interview. So <laughs> that's, now you understand. Okay. Our history is buried. Now, another question I have for you is that, do you recall uh, uh, some of your high school teachers? Yes, I had a Mr. Baptiste, a biology teacher. Yeah. And I remember Mr. Baptiste because he was an army man. And he used to, he said, in the army every day you had to exercise and you had to be flexible and stretch. And he... He taught me two things. He said that people had to be able to put their palm on the floor without bending their legs, their knees. Okay? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I did that. I was able to do it. I was the only one in the class able to do it. And then he taught me another trick. He said, every morning I want you to get against the wall, stand up facing the wall, get on your tippy toe and stretch your arm out and try to reach as high as you can. He said, what this will do for you is that it's going to straighten out your muscles and, and, and your bone, make sure you, you'll be flexible. And he said, you barely, you're never going to get hurt hardly. He said, because you'll be so flexible, your muscles will be able to, ex uh, you know, accept a lot, of, a lot of wear and tear without being hurt. Mm -hmm. And I did that every morning. I listened. So I have to add that in the story. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, Mr. Baptiste was one. Uh, Miss Elwall was another one. Uh, that's a lady. Miss Duval was another one. Miss Gaines. Uh, and my, I remember we had a industrial art. Mr. Willie Dangerfield was my industrial art teacher, so... Uh, had a, uh, a Miss Belazar taught me math, a Miss uh, uh, Celestine taught me math, a Miss Johnson taught me English. So uh, there was some of the people from different uh, years in school. Mm -hmm. Now, other than the biology, well, what did you learn from you from uh, uh, from math? Well, I was, that was my best subject. Uh, and uh, I was so impressive. The lady who was from there teaching, and she had gone to college, and she said, I'm so, how did you learn this? And I said, I taught myself. Because she knew about the education situation in my family, you got me? Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm impressed. And I said, I had to remember in my mind. I had to play with numbers and remember them because, you know, I said I was always playing with numbers, so. Okay. Now, uh, there was a teacher, Elwood? Elwall. Elwall, okay. Okay, and the what? Elwalls were the most educated people in that area. Okay. All of them go, went to college. They were very educated. It's a bunch of them. One lady had 18 kids. They all went to, you know, went to college. <laughs> I mean, you know, but they were the most educated ones, that Elwall family, were mm. educators. Right. And she taught what subject? Uh, Miss Elwall taught me uh, the, the uh, home economics. I even took home economics. Okay. So that you learn how to cook and sew? There you go. I thought it was something that, you know, see, that's one of the things in that the school system had. And Mr. Industrial Art with Mr. Daniel Field and Mr. Cleve Taylor, they taught me in the Industrial Art. Those things need to come back in school, you know. Uh, Yes, oh, yes, I'm listening, I'm listening. Okay. Uh, and because they have taken away the industrial 
cards and all of that out of out of the schooling. The high school, that's one of the problem where the young minorities, they can't get, all of them ain't going to college. That's why they were getting an apprenticeship from there. They learn a trade, you got me? Mm-hmm. And they could go out and learn, earn a good living, you got me? Yes. Now okay. those things are going forever. Okay. Now another teacher you uh, said, was it Mr. or Mrs. Gaines? Mrs. Gaines? Duval, I didn't, I don't know, I have no Duval, Duval, okay. Yeah. Duval, what's, what's... She was like a principal teacher. She was, she was married to a game. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, she was, you know, she was in that game family. Mm-hmm. What, you sub, know. what subject did she teach? I think she was an English teacher. Oh, okay. Okay. What did she impart to you about English? Well, she was always big on trying to speak correctly and making sure we understand the verbs and the noun situation, how to, when to, and when not to use them. You know, you got to understand when you're the, in my situation where I didn't learn the, because of not attending primary school, on a regular basis, you don't get the the foundation in place. You got me. Mm-hmm. So you ad lib. You got me. Yes. So I was ad libbing that, doing the best I could, and and that was always being straight out to make sure I could put them all together. And she worked. I have to give her credit because those people had a lot of students to work with, but they they try to give the love and care to every individual. Who wanted it? You know what I'm saying? Uh huh. You know. Oh, okay. That was the real, real value of, of having and being in a in a in a segregated situation. You got that kind of love. Now, had had they been equal, giving us all the necessities, segregated situation wouldn't have been bad. You got that? Uh mm-hmm. But because they didn't give us all of the necessities. It made it bad because they gave us outdated books. They didn't provide enough teachers, they, 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 enough stuff in the classroom where kids could learn. But these people taught anyway. I mean, they got creative. They didn't say, okay, you're not going to give it to them, but still teach my students. And they went to work, you know. Oh, okay. Now, how did you end up at Southern? You said you played basketball. And baseball, which did you play first? At Southern? Yes. Baseball. I went there, let me tell you. Uh, I got pretty good in baseball. And so Solomon Jackson, my coach, took me to, to Southern University to see the baseball coach. And uh, and the baseball coach said, oh, we've heard about it, we got a scholarship for him. And again, this is the situation back in those days. Okay, you got a scholarship. He gave us no paperwork. And we left. Went back to New Orleans and they gave me a number, and I called that number a hundred times. Never once got an answer. So the scholarship never came. School start in the fall. I don't get to go to school. There is no scholarship. You got me? Yes. Uh huh. Continue. So, so rather than give up and say somebody screwed me around, I went and picked my card and said, I'm going to school in January. That's what I said. I'm going to go to school in January. And I went and picked up a couple hundred dollars worth per con, saved it. And in December, I went to Southern, took a bus and went to Southern. And, uh, Trying to find places. Remember, I'd only been on Southern Campus once, so I tried to find my way around there. A guy who used to officiate basketball game by the name of Alex Aceberg. He was the equipment manager at Southern. And he said, hey, boy, where have you been? I hadn't seen you in school. I said, they never gave me my scholarship. He said, you come on in here. He took me in to see the athletic director, Dean Jones. Your Mrs. Dean Jones. Yes. 
Yes. And Dean Jones says, Kato, I remember you. I saw you play basketball. You were a hell of a basketball player. I saw the scholarship hunts there for you. I don't know why he never sent it to you. He said, but I tell you what, you come back in a few days, I'm going to give you a full basketball scholarship. You do not have to play basketball the first year. You can play baseball, but you have to play basketball the next year. I sigh relief. Wow. So what happened? Well, I went back and the scholarship was there. A couple of weeks later, I went back and he did exactly what he said he would. Unlike Hines did in baseball, you got that? Mm -hmm. Hines did sign the scholarship, but he never sent it. (laughs) I never got it, you got that? And he never had the decency, and I say decency, to pick up the phone and call me. Because he had my number, you got that? Mm -hmm. That's what they're supposed to do. The kid is being recruited. You know, you shouldn't recruit the the coach. The coach recruited the kid. You got this? I understand. So, Dean Jones, U.S. Dean Jones, Ulysses Dean Jones, had my scholarship prepared for me. And I went to school. And uh, and I went out for baseball. Just like he said, I could play baseball the first year. And I made the baseball team. You know what's so ironic about me going out for the baseball team, guess who were out for the same position I was playing first base? Harold Carmichael. You heard of him? Yes. Wide receiver, wide receiver for Southern and then wide receiver for the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. The Hall of Famer now. He's in the yes. Hall of Fame. Yes. 6'8". He mm-hmm. and I played basketball together at Southern also. And then they had another boy, Isaiah Butch Robinson. Yes. Played linebacker for 15 years in the NFL. Yeah. They were, <laughs> they were, they were competing for first base. But along with me, I'm a skinny, these big, massive guys. And I'm a skinny little guy over there. And, you know, when Cut came, the, 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 the beast hunts cut those two guys to keep me. Can you believe that? I tease me. Call Michael about it all the time. I said, can you because we call him Stoke. I said, can you please? Hines kept me over you. He said, I don't know how he did it. <laughs> but he kept me. And that was, and so uh, I played my freshman year. And then uh, come August, I had to go for basketball. I had to go play basketball. And I played basketball. And I played basketball for three years and baseball for four. And that was my, my, you know, and I got drafted by Atlanta Braves in the 10th round back in 73. So now you know my story as a Southern athlete. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, and I was the last, in the last class out of high school to play in your L-O-I-E. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping I'm saying the letters L- right. L-I-A-L-O. Okay. Yeah. I was in the last class, 69. To oh. play in that, it, because it became, they disbanded to go merge with the uh, the all-white situation. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, um, thank you very much for the interview, but uh, what I also wanted to bring to your attention, you have a book, uh, Against All Odds, um, and one thing about this book, I read your book. And your book, uh, when I analyzed what was going on, your, your, book, your book gave a good history of Southern University baseball. I think you did a very good job of that. So if uh, someone wanted to understand the history of Southern baseball, that was a, that was a good prep into learning what about Southern University baseball? Well, I tried to do my best, uh, you know, because, and the reason I probably highlighted more baseball is because the bulk of my experience with Southern was coaching Southern baseball. Mm-hmm. I coached baseball for 33 years as the head coach at Southern. And I coached uh, 30 seven years totally and worked 40 years at Southern. So I had a lot of history. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, uh, uh, and if you go back to my uh, my amateur or collegiate days, I have a over f- almost 50 years relationship with that university. So I know a lot of stuff. But baseball, I can recite it with my eyes closed. And that's what I used to do with my math in high school. That's how I uh, developed a good fund for memory, by reciting Back then, that was it was amazing. They were telling me uh, that you can learn a lot when you close your eyes and, and recite things. I, I don't know if if that was part of some teaching uh, that you might have gotten that tea and leave it. But I found that to be a working uh, for me. It worked for me because I used to do that: close my eyes and concentrate. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, Things became a little clearer to me, so. Okay. Uh, okay. So, basically, I'd like to thank you for this interview. I think it was very, in, uh, it gave us a good idea about what was going on in the LIALO in your early competition. You took care of two sports, basketball and baseball. You couldn't do football. Or you, did you ever do track? I could have, but I would. <laughs> My mother first was never going to let me play football, okay? Okay. <laughs> and I didn't want to play a game like that because I didn't want to get hurt, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I a... didn't like what football brought to the table, so. Okay. I, I, sports was enough, and, you know, and both of them, you know, that were people who told me that I had the ability if I had gotten in the NBA with the right team, I could have played in the NBA, but I never fooled myself, you know, and thought that, you know. But, you know, I had uh, my work took me into baseball, and I was able to play professional baseball for five years. So I feel very fortunate from my humble beginning. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so Coach Kadar, thank you very much for this interview. Dr. Healy, it was an honor and a pleasure for me doing this with you.